communication is going to flow from top down on the sending device and then the receiving device is going to have to flow from bottom up. So let's walk through this process together because it's actually known as the data encapsulation process. But why is it called that? Well, we'll see that here as we walk step by step through the process. But let's build a scenario first. We have a sender. A sender. Well, let's say that this sender is going to www.cisco.com. So we're just trying to contact a web server. That's all we're trying to do. So we have to hook in to the actual application layer. You can see that here with that user data at the application layer. Now let's go down one step in our TCP IP stack and we get to the transport layer. Notice our user data is still there. But now we have to pick the most appropriate protocol to use for transport. In this case, we're using HTTP. Do we want reliable connectivity here, Dan, at the transport layer? We absolutely do. HTTP would be an application that builds off of a transport layer protocol of TCP. So yes. So Raymond, now that I have determined that I use TCP, what does that mean to us here? Well, we need to put the most appropriate header now on this user data. So we need to add the actual TCP header. If we were using UDP, we'd put a UDP header on that. If we were using a completely different transport layer protocol, then we put the most appropriate header in there. And then the information that's required for that particular transport layer protocol would have to be added in. We'll talk more about the actual header itself later on, but we can see an example here with our layer 4 header. Let's move down to the internet layer. We still have our user data. We still have the header that we got from the transport layer. But now we have to attach another header. Now at the internet layer, Dan, which protocol are we using? Ooh, let's ask the audience. What protocol have we discussed lives at the internet layer? And I know, I can't hear what you're saying. But if you're talking into your computer's microphone, which isn't active here, you should be saying internet protocol. Raymond, internet protocol. So, Raymond, layer four header, TCP. Layer three header, IP. And now we've actually seen the two big players of the TCP IP suite. They're not the only players, though. We've determined that already. But they're the most common of the protocols. So, Raymond, my layer three header is IP. What would I expect to find in the IP header? Well, definitely we expect to find IP addresses. We're going to have a source IP address. We're going to have a destination IP address. Those are the two really big players. Keep that in mind. And we will dive deeper into this header a little later on as well. But let's take all of that now and let's move down to that network access layer. A little more going on here. Notice we still have the user data. We still have the layer 4 header, the layer 3 header. So all that information is retained. But now we have to add on another header, that layer 2 header. And what do we find inside of that layer 2 header? Well, we're going to find addressing as well. Dan talked about that. Remember? Data link layer of the OSI model. What do we find? What do we find? I remember him saying MAC addresses. So we'll find MAC addresses inside that Layer 2 header when we're transmitting over Ethernet. But again, this Layer 2 header is going to totally de be dependent on the actual physical media we're using. At the very end, Dan, I see an FCS. What is an FCS? Because I don't see it anywhere else. It's a frame check sequence. It is a mathematical check that is run against what we have inside of this to make sure that we don't have muddled data. Remember that computer adage, garbage in equals garbage out. Well, we're worried about communicating 
garbage information and not recognizing it as garbage information. So the frame check sequence makes sure that all of our ones and zeros that we send when received are the same. <laughs> we don't want that to change. And then, okay, so I got that. I got to shove it onto the network somehow, some way as ones and zeros or bits, bits. Bits are just ones and zeros that are communicating what we see up above. So Dan, we've sent out our request to get the website www.cisco.com. So it's going across the wire now. What's going to happen when Cisco's web server receives it? Well, we have to think to ourselves, that's probably going to have to have gone through a few routers along the way, maybe 15, 17, 20 routers. And then it winds up on Cisco's one of many web servers at cisco.com. They're going to reverse this process. So I think of the process like when I get on a plane. When I get on a plane, we would call that boarding, right? What do we call it when we get off of a plane? It's a weird word that I've heard in the last five, 10 years. They call it deplaning. <laughs> I, I always get a kind of a little weird chuckle, Raymond, when they say, it's time to deplane, or when, in, when you deplane. Okay, I'm deplaning, I'm getting out of the plane. Here, we're de-encapsulating. We also call this decapsulation. So it's okay to call it de-encapsulation or decapsulation. The more technical people in the industry do in fact call it decapsulation instead of de-encapsulation. Uh, regardless of how you call it, we have headers. They have to be read, they have to be removed. That's ultimately what the de-encapsulation process is describing. What really? Uh, let's dig into this, Raymond. How does the decapsulation process take effect once I start to see some bits that are being received by my network interface card? Well, this Cisco server here is going to receive all these different bits, and then we got to pass it up to the data link layer where it's converted back into the structure we see here. We can see that layer two header. And this layer two header is going to have information in it. If this particular data is intended for me, this web server, then I'm going to find my information in there. And that's going to tell me that this is intended for me. So what do I do with it? I obliterate that header. I take it off. I remove it and throw it in the garbage can. I double check that FCS first to make sure that nothing's been corrupted or damaged in transit. All right, that gets removed as well. So what am I left with? Well, I'm left with the layer three information and everything else that is coupled with it's still that layer four header and the user data. So what do we do? Well, that's passed up to our internet layer, Dan. And what do we do there? Well, I make sure that that's for me at the internet layer as well. I'll have an IP address. So what I'll do is I'll look at this packet that is being handed to my protocol of IP, and I'll look, is this for my IP address? There's another possibility, though. There's a, there's a broadcast IP address as well, where it's all 255s. So I'll also make sure that it isn't a broadcast where everybody has to receive it, and not just me. But this wouldn't be a broadcast, would it? Let's go back and do a sanity check for a moment. This is an HTTP request. This is a web request. And it crossed a number of routers to get there. We don't do that with broadcasts. We don't send a broadcast very far. So the only way it's going to wind up received by me is if it's for my MAC address. We figured that out at layer two. And then it's for my IP address. Maybe they did a DNS request. They know my public IP address. And they encoded that in the layer three header. So I see that. I see that, and this is my IP address, Raymond, so I'm going to read that. I'm going to retain who I'm talking with, the IP address there, but I'm going to decapsulate and hand it up to the transport layer protocol. So up at the transport layer, now we have the layer four header, 
still tacked on to that user data. We look inside that header. We read the information that's in there. We make the decisions based on what's in that transport header. In this case, we're dealing with TCP traffic. And it's going to have a pointer in it telling us what the actual application layer protocol actually is. So we know who to hand it off to next. In this case, we're dealing with HTTP. So it's got to go to the HTTP functions of this particular web server. So we do what we have to do, obliterate that header, send it up to the application layer. That application layer hooks in to the actual web services of that web server. And the web server reads the actual data and states, OK, I have to send this information back. What does it do with that information? Well, it has to go back down through the whole encapsulation process to send it back out on the wire, that response to get www.cisco.com. And then our original sending PC that was asking for www.cisco.com, it's going to receive all the bits, gobble up all those bits, and go back through this data de-encapsulation process as well. So can you see how important it is to understand this end-to-end -end communication and how breaking it up into these different layers is really important? Because now we can see that we have to go down the model, across the wire, back up the model, and then down, across, and up. And we continuously do that over and over and over again as we have our end-to-end -end communications. But Dan, it's not just about going up and down and up and down the model. As we are encapsulating we're doing something specific that's really important for our peer-to-peer -peer communication. When we have these headers, the headers are built to talk to other things that work at this layer. When I encapsulate a transport layer header, such as TCP, I'm really talking to the receiving end and its TCP element. Think of it as a module, a module of the protocol suite logic that resides at the receiver. So the logic that I encode at the transport layer on my side is there to communicate with the receiving end as well at that same layer. We have that with internet as well. But intermediary devices start to really deeply care about what I'm doing with my IP protocol suite. When a router routes, they're going to be reading that header as well. They're not going to strip it off, though. They will read it, but it will be retained. Because a router is going to forward based on my destination IP address. So when I encode these headers, it's there to talk about everything else that works at layer 3 if it's a packet header. Or if it's a frame header, it's to talk to things that work at layer 2 of the OSI model. And Raymond, I can start to see the middle here. Data, segments, packets, frames, bits. What, what is that? When I say, or let's say it a different way. Raymond, are packets and frames interchangeable? You'll hear people use them interchangeably, but are they truly interchangeable terms? No, they mean completely, totally different things. As we are going up and down, our communications model, and we're adding on these headers, we actually have names for these. Segment. A segment is created once we attach our transport layer header to that user data. We pass that down to the internet layer. We are creating a packet once we put on the internet layer header. And then we move down to the network access layer, we throw on that header, and we're creating a frame. These are completely different entities. They don't mean the exact same thing. So we have to understand these names separately here and don't interchange them and confuse them. Raymond, routers are layer three, right? So when we're talking about a router routing, do we say that a router routes segments, a router routes packets, or a router routes frames? A router is going to route packets because a router is making its decision based on the information inside of that packet header. So what header are we talking about? We're talking about the internet header, the layer three header, 
or the network layer header, whatever you want to call it, we're looking at the destination IP address in that packet. So our routers are forwarding packets. What about a switch, Raymond? What does a switch forward? Well, a switch, our layer two switches, they're going to be forwarding frames because they make their decisions based on the information that we find inside of that frame header. So for example, the destination MAC address. We look at that destination MAC address. Where do we find that? We find that in that network access header or layer two header or data link layer header, all meaning the same thing, but that's in the frame. So our switches forward frames. 